Well, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, I work with several folks at Iowa State, so, and I've been here many times. I've never been to this department before, so this is exciting. Uh, so what are we going to do? A little bit about me first, mostly so I can show you my picture of the hellbender. That's me holding a hellbender. I know all you herpetologists in the room are jealous. <laughs> I just have to include it. That's me holding a koala bear. All you koala bear people, I don't know what that's called. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> so I actually have a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Michigan, and then a PhD and a master's degree from UNC Chapel Hill. My graduate work was actually looking at international drinking water projects and the role of participation. Um, I use all of the same research methods today in my work in the agricultural Midwest. Just the context is very different. I've been at, tw at Purdue for over 12 years now, and I have a three-way appointment. So if any of you are interested in land-grant universities and what that means, I'm happy to answer questions. So I have 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% extension. Um, I, when I first got to Purdue, the first project I got involved in, which really jump-started everything that you're going to hear today, was this project looking at social indicators of non-point source pollution. It was an EPA initiative that was funded through 319 in the six states in EPA Region 5. And we developed something called the Social Indicators Planning and Evaluation System. We call it SIPES. Michigan calls it SIPPIES. And I think you've really made it when people pronounce your acronym in different ways. <laughs> That's my <laughs> so, um, But it's been used by over 30 watershed projects in our region and many more um, around the country and the world. So, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really based off what I learned in that very early project that I did at Purdue. In general, what I'm interested in researching is how to get the public to participate and be engaged in natural resource decision making how to get people and managers to use climate information. And I, I'm manager of a large USDA NIFA funded grant called Useful to Usable. That's a partner grant to the corn cap that's housed in sociology here at Iowa State that you might have heard of. Um, we're a smaller grant, we're only $5 million. But we work with them. And I'm really interested in what motivates and catalyzes watershed management efforts. And you'll hear more about that as I talk. I'm part of a multi-state hatch that includes um, Lois Wright Morton, from Iowa State, Jay Arbuckle as well, although he is not neither of these pictures um, from our, our team meetings um, over the last couple of years. And I'm really mostly interested in how do we get people to do the right things environmentally. So I focus on, we did one project on getting people to drink less bottled water. Done some work with colleagues in my department on eastern hellbenders and endangered mussels, trying to get people not to hurt them. Um, and a lot of the reason, a lot of the ways people can not hurt hellbenders and mussels is by protecting water quality, which is my connection there. I'm definitely not a wildlife person, but I am a water quality person. And a lot of work, of course, with watershed management, um, focusing on both farmers and urban residents, and I'm going to talk about farmers today. So why do we care about farmers? Uh, Mississippi River Basin, you've probably seen this picture before. I'm in it here in Indiana. You're in it in Iowa. And we are contributing to hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. But it's really, really challenging to address hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico and deal with non-point source pollution. Um, non-point source is a major cause of water quality impairment, and agriculture is one of the main sources, especially like landscapes like you have here around Ames and landscapes like we have around West Lafayette, Indiana. There are very limited regulatory options. There's a lot of talk about regulating non-point source, but it's very unclear what that would actually mean. How would we even do that, even if we decided politically that we had the will to do it. So we mostly try and address non-point source pollution through persuasion and voluntary practices. So we offer people money, we give them technical support, and we do a lot of outreach and education to try and get people to adopt practices. To do that, we have to understand what's going to motivate people. And we don't know enough about what motivates people. We are unfortunately not rational beings. And life would be a lot easier if we were. But, but we're not. And farmers are just like us, and they're not rational. So we struggle to understand them. So I run the Natural Resource Social Science Lab at Purdue. This is a picture of my group at ISSRM in Charleston last year. And this is a group of students assembling surveys that got mailed this summer. We do a lot of surveys. We do a lot of interviews. We do focus groups. We do lit reviews. We do sort of facilitated meetings with stakeholders. We gather data in all sorts of different ways. And what I'm going to do today is present a lot of different research. If you have questions about any of the particular methodologies, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm going to do a very quick rundown just because I know it's a diverse audience. And we have the same kind of a, an audience. I'm in the Forestry and Natural Resources Department at Purdue. And I really like it when social scientists come and speak and at, lend some credibility to their research. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the credibility behind the work we do. And then I'm going to tell you what we've learned. And, but if you, again, if you have questions about any, in any particular project, feel free to, to ask. Um, we do a lot of surveys. Surveys are generally quantitative. And you get statistically analyzable data if you have a random sample of your population or a census. 
We do, in our group, we do a lot of careful design of questions. We do a lot of pre-testing of all of our surveys. Um, we have a lot of surveys that carry from question to question that have been used in many, many watersheds and many states. And we use different modes of delivery, so it depends who we're trying to survey. We do mail surveys. We've done some phone surveys, although I'm not a huge fan of phone surveys. We also do internet surveys if our population is clearly defined and has email addresses, such as crop advisors for whom we can actually get email addresses, but we don't have mail addresses. We email those folks. We also do interviews, and the way we do interviews, they're usually qualitative, and they help us answer why. So surveys tell us how many people are doing something, but they don't tell us why they're doing that and what's motivating them. So we do interviews to try and find that out. We usually use a purposive sample, so our results are not strictly generalizable. We're just really intentionally trying to find different people who have different perspectives. Again, we use very careful design of questions, and we pretest. The goal when we do our interviews is to get saturation. We want to stop hearing new things. So we have identified all of the themes in the population of interest. And then we code our data. Always more than, more than one person is coding data to make sure that we are actually coding what somebody said, not just our own biased viewpoint on what they said. We do a lot of intercoder reliability checks, and we usually use grounded theory. All right, so enough of that. What are the problems with watershed management? So the first problem is that we have to pick a watershed where we think our work is going to be successful. Ideally, we could work everywhere across the entire Midwestern landscape dealing with this issue of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. But in reality, we don't have enough money. So I argue that we, we should be strategic in where we spend our money, and we should start spending our money in watersheds where we think we're more likely to be successful. We often pick watersheds because they're environmentally challenged, and that's great. We obviously want to pick watersheds that are environmentally challenged, but we also should be thinking about the social context of that watershed in terms of what's going to make something more successful. And not all watersheds are created equal in terms of, of both, well, both environmental and social. This is just a, a snapshot from the Sparrow model, which shows watersheds that are contributing towards nutrient loading. And we, can, we could create the same map of watersheds that have high, high or low social capacity if we could figure out how to measure that in a consistent way. What we have tried to do is try to understand where programs are more or less successful, socially speaking. Some of the criteria are watershed projects tend to be more successful and there's paid watershed staff. When you have active conservation groups in the watershed, so groups like Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, um, any kind of conservation group that's bringing people together. Where there is high interagency trust and collaboration, I think we've probably all seen groups where you have, even if people are co-located, so you might have the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the Soil and Water Conservation District co-located, but they don't talk to each other, you're not going to get great success, right? You really need all the conservation professionals in that watershed to like each other, to work well together, and to, well, at least tolerate each other. Um, <laughs> It's helpful when there is already problem salience and awareness in a watershed. So the, tar the target audience, which in this case, for the purposes of this talk, is farmers, already recognizes that what they are doing has an impact on water quality, right? And some watersheds do have more of a recognition of that than others. Watersheds where basic BMPs have already been adopted. So we know we need to do more than just get standard best management practices or BMPs adopted on the landscape. To really address our nutrient problems, we have to get many more exciting practices adopted. I talked this morning um, about saturated buffers. You're not going to get a farmer to adopt a saturated buffer if they're not even using no-till yet. Right? No-till is a much lower barrier to adopt no-till than a saturated buffer. So if you can work in a watershed where some of those basic BMPs are already adopted, that's helpful. No-till is not as, not as popular here as it is in Indiana. You might have a different BMP to pick than no-till. Um, and a watershed where some farmers are recognized conservation leaders and they are, they are respected by the community. So a watershed that I think is a good example of a watershed that had high, si high social capacity is Indian Creek, Illinois. Um, we just finished an evaluation of this project. We were asked to evaluate it because all the partners thought it was super successful and they wanted it documented. So we went in skeptically because that's what we do. And we did find that it was successful. Um, so, so since 2011, over 50% of land is now in some form of conservation. That's one measure of success. And that's a, pretty, that's a really high percentage of land in a watershed to be in conservation. So that's a good measure of success. A more subjective measure of success could be, I, w I went to a field day there this summer. There were 100 people. This is a small watershed. There were 100 people at the field day. That's also a great measure of success, right? That people are actually invested. They're interested. So by different measures, this is a, su a successful project. 
Why is it successful? So some of these things that we've, that we've argued in other papers are important. There's high problem salience. That watershed feeds into drinking water in the town of Pontiac, which is downstream. So they're aware. They're not thinking about this distant issue of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, right? They're thinking about their neighbors just downstream who need to drink the water. It's a very, very cohesive community. People like each other. There are, I think, two churches in this watershed, and everybody goes to one of those two churches. Um, there's very minimal rented land, so you've got a lot of landowners who are actually making decisions on the land because they're farming it. It's a very small watershed, and very, very dedicated paid staff who bring other staff together from other organizations. It's really clear when you just walk into a room with these people how much they like each other. The field day I went to, they were all working together in the kitchen, cooking the food, and clearly enjoying each other. And that's where you start to get more success. So once you find this perfect, amazing watershed where you're going to have all the conditions are right for success, then you have to actually get people engaged. So we've argued um, in a paper that we wrote about catalyst events that you need some sort of a catalyst. So you might have this great baseline where people like each other. There's a paid watershed staff member. There's you know, problem salience. But something has to change. Something has to shake that community up to get them to start doing something, right? Catalysts can be many, many things. Um, and if the catalyst is utilized correctly, it should ideally lead to changed conditions and a very active watershed group, lots of adoption of practices. In the Indian Creek watershed, there are three things that I think served as catalysts. The first is, one of the things they did before they even got money, they formed a steering committee. When we interviewed people, so a, a very common thing people said was, everyone feels like they're part of it. So they formed this committee and they got people excited and nobody felt left out. They got a lot of funding. Funding is a very popular catalyst because you know funding definitely creates some energy in a watershed. <laughs> but the third thing that they did, and I think the most important thing that they did, they engaged retailers from the very beginning of this project. They got retailers talking about what was going on. Retailers and farmers and conservation staff sitting down together saying, we need to do something about water quality in this watershed. So bringing industry into it. Farmers listen to ag retailers. It's their own people they've been working with. Another quote um, from a fertilizer dealer, back to the issue of what do I see as being the key elements for success, good working relationships among all of the various entities that can be involved. And that includes the fertilizer chemical, de chemical dealers, the fertilizer chemical association, the various ag groups and organizations, the fertilizer supply companies, all the way up and down the food chain for the ag suppliers. And locally here in the watershed, we've had very good buy-in amongst the various organizations. Partnerships and buy-in, one of the main reasons for success. So before we did this work in Indian Creek, I'd been preaching about the importance of retailers for a while um, based on this chart, which um, is from a survey that we did, part of the Useful to Usable Project and Sustainable Corn, which is the corn cap run out of um, Iowa State here. So Jay Arbuckle and I um, were the two leads on this survey. One of the questions on our survey, to, which went to 19,000 farmers across the Corn Belt, we had close to 5,000 response respondents and we, we showed there was no non-response bias according to um, ag census data. So please indicate how influential the following groups and individuals are when you make decisions about ag practices and strategies was the question. I'm going to put the chart up. It's like one of the few data slides I'm going to show you. I will tell you, you don't need to try and read everything. I will tell you what it says. It's grouped from left to right. The groups on the left are the most influential. The groups on the right are the least influential to farmers. So on the left here, so the most influential groups we see Family, chemical dealer, seed dealer, followed very closely by consultants. We can't really influence family and friends. Well, we could try, but that's kind of like influencing the farmer themselves, right? But I argue we really do need to be influencing chemical dealers, seed dealers, and consultants. Way down the list here is university extension, with a full 40% of the corn growers in the Midwest telling us that they either have no contact with extension or extension has no influence on their farm management practices. So I argue what that says is that extension needs to be working with these groups who already have the ear of farmers. How easy will that be to do? Um, I, I thought so that's not the slide I was expecting. This is where we did our survey. So I put this in the wrong order. Um, so we did our survey. This, the farmer survey was representative to each of these huck, huck six um, watersheds that are outlined here in green. We also surveyed farm advisors. So we surveyed those crop retailers and the consultants and conservation staff and all sorts of different advisors in four states. So we did Michigan, Indiana, Iowa, and Nebraska. And in our advisor survey, we had a question which was not about influence. The question I showed you was about influence. Who influences your decisions? In the advisor survey, we asked a question about trust. 
who do you trust? It was about climate change information because it was a climate change survey, but we asked who do you trust for climate change information? This is grouped from top is most trusted, least, bottom is least trusted, and you can clearly see that Extension is trusted by those advisors. So if Extension were to work with those advisors who have the ear of the farmers, we could really get some things done, right? Um, what people always like to look at this list because what's at the bottom here is who's least trusted, which is envir environmental organizations really trust out Yeah, yeah. Well, and you have to think about how in a farmer's head what an environmental organization is, right? They're thinking Greenpeace kind of environmental organization. I can't remember if it's, we've had any EGs on the survey. Do we have any EGs, John? You were involved in that survey. I don't think we did. Oh, you went on this survey. You were on the other survey. You were on the farmer one, yeah. not the advisor one. Um, so environmental organizations, mainstream news media, radio talk show hosts, and blogs and social media are the least trusted groups. Um, so just kind of interesting. A little hopeful, maybe, especially about radio talk show hosts. Depends on your perspective. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I'll say about trust, I don't have a slide. I almost put one in, and it wasn't pretty, and I just took it out. Um, so the, question, the farmer survey we asked was, who influences you? Lots of other farmer surveys, including ones that we have done, ask, who do you trust for information? Just like advisors, farmers also trust extension. That is their most trusted group. But they are not influenced by extension because they're not having contact with extension, right? So influence is not the same as trust, and it's just really important that you walk away with that in mind. It's not that extension is this you know, not trusted group out there by farmers. So sometimes I get in trouble when I don't include that, that little commentary. Um, we actually have a paper coming out in Journal of American Water Resources Association that, that compares the question about farmer trust across many, many watersheds in the Midwest and finds that, yes, consistently farmers most trust extension. It's true. All right, so we've identified our watershed with high social capacity. We've created some sort of catalyst event that's fomenting change, be that catalyst, you know, getting their ag retailers involved, bringing in money. We still have to reach our individual farmers, right? So Hannah's got to go out now. She's got all these other things going for her, and now she's got to go out and get the farmers, right? So how are you going to do it? <laughs> so these are some of the terms that people like to throw around in terms of what motivates farmers. It's norms, it's money, it's trust, it's information, it's risk perceptions. Um, we've tried to break that down a little bit over the years of my, the work that my group has done. Um, several of you, I think, are familiar with this work, which first was published in 2008. So when I started doing ag conservation work, um, my dissertation, as I mentioned, was all about India and participation and women and rural drinking water. And then I came to Indiana and we started the Social Indicators Project. We got a couple of USDA grants that looked at ag conservation. And I thought, well, surely no one's done a lit review. We'll just do a lit review. And then <laughs> that will tell us the answer. So <laughs> I was, you know, I was naive. It's okay. Um, so we, we studied all of the, the studies that were in the U.S. We focused only on the U.S. that had some sort of quantitative measure of what was motivating farmers to adopt practices. Um, so the, pro the surveys ranged from beef cattle that was in Louisiana, water quality in California, all across the country, all different types of ag, trying to really tease out what motivates farmer adoption of practices. What did we learn? Not a whole lot. We learned that farmers aren't very rational, so it's really hard to predict what they're going to do. What a surprise. I probably should have known that. Uh, <laughs> so some things that we did find aren't really very interesting. So for example, age. The older a farmer is, the less likely he, usually he, is to adopt a practice. But that's not a very policy sensitive variable, right? You can't go out and like make a whole bunch of younger farmers so they're more interested in adopting your practices. Similarly, farm size. The larger a farm, the more likely a farmer is to adopt conservation practices. But not very interesting, right? Because we can't go out and <coughs> draw people new farm sizes. Here, you got a bigger farm, so now go out and do friendly things. We did find not very many studies looked at environmental attitudes, but the ones that did, we found that environmental attitudes were positively related to conservation to practice adoptions. So the more positive someone's environmental attitudes were, the more likely they were to, were to adopt. We've probed into that in several studies since then to really try and understand environmental attitudes in more detail. There's a lot of good work actually going on here in the social department looking at this as well. Um, one of our studies, we identified three main types of farmers, and we're seeing these, these three types pop up again and again in other, other interviews that we're doing of farmers. So all farmers, I would just want to preface this by saying all farmers are motivated by farm as business to some extent. 
If you're not motivated by your farm as a business and you're a farmer, you're going to go out of business and you'll stop being a farmer. Right? But some farmers are more motivated by that than other farmers. And all they talk about in an interview when you ask why they do something is the bottom line. Right? It's all about the money. But other farmers are more open. Some farmers are motivated by stewardship concerns. They're thinking about the future of their land and what's going to happen. And other farmers are actually motivated by off-farm benefits. Those are the farmers who care about the drinking water supply in Pontiac or potentially even hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico or in, in parts of Indiana, um, hypoxia in Lake Erie, since we, we drain two ways. So, so yeah, so there's, so there's lots of different attitudes and understanding these attitudes can be really helpful for understanding what's going to motivate people and for developing communication materials um, for farmers. Back to our, our study, the final finding we found, and this was the strongest finding of our study, and Noller and Bradshaw actually published a study the year before we published ours, which was an international look at adoption of conservation practices, and they found the exact same thing. That the number one factor predicting adoption of conservation practices is social networks. Who's in your network and how often are you talking to them is the number one thing. So I'll put back up this slide that you've seen before because I think it's really important. Who's in the farmers' networks? It's the retailers and the crop consultants. That's who we have to be working with. We know networks are important, so we've got to be tying into these networks that already exist. There's a lot of movements actually started here in Iowa, um, the on-farm network, um, to try and build formal networks of farmers, really building upon this literature and evidence that networks are important and people talking to each other is important. So formal networks where you get a group of farmers together and you call them a network and they meet together once a year and they look at results of corn stock tests and they sit around and talk about their data. Um, the theory is, based on what we know about networks, is that should lead to a difference, right? That should lead to more uptake and adoption of conservation practices. As far as I know, and I'd be interested if anybody knows differently, no one's really evaluated those networks before to see if they work. So they are now in Indiana, so we did an evaluation, so I'll tell you what we learned. Um, we evaluated participants in two networks. So on-farm network came to Indiana from Iowa. They just changed the name last year. I guess they didn't want to be like Iowa anymore. I don't know. But it was on-farm network when we evaluated it. And, um, and participants in, a, in adap an adapt N network, which drained into Lake Erie. So it was on the eastern side, northeastern part of Indiana. What we found in that study, we did interviews and we did surveys of the participants. We found that the longer someone participated, so if someone had participated up to five years, they were more likely to report that they had changed their nitrogen rates and practices, so length of participation in those networks was important, which makes sense because these aren't changes that a farmer is going to make overnight. But the farmers who are participating in the networks were already higher performing than other farmers. At the same time we did our survey of the network farmers, we also did a random sample survey of farmers across the entire state of Indiana, and we included the same questions. And we found that the farmers in the networks, more educated, already adopting, already using more practices, higher environmental attitudes, we know environmental attitudes are important. So, so while they are changing as they're a part of this network, they might have changed anyway because they're already higher performing farmers, right? So, so it's not conclusive evidence to me that these networks are changing anything. The other thing we found is that the participating farmers did not talk to other people about what they learned. So the benefits of the networks were constrained to the network participants, which, and I think we can do a lot better than that. So we have a lot of recommendations about how those networks can be improved. I don't think they're a bad thing, um, but there's a lot more that needs to be done to really deliver on the potential of what networks can do. So I'm happy to report that I just submitted that paper yesterday for review. So maybe someday it'll come out. Um, so practice characteristics. We've talked about the farmer themselves. The actual characteristics of a practice are also important for getting adoption. So not all practices are created equal. We talked about, you know, it's a lot easier to get someone to think about no-till than it is to get them to think about adopting a saturated buffer. Um, what we've learned in our work is it's really important to focus on raising awareness of on-farm and financial benefits environmental benefits of a practice, and really I would say most importantly, how compatible a practice is with current farm practices. If you can convince a farmer that this isn't like, that this is actually going to work with other things that they are doing, because the farm system, it's a whole system, right? And people aren't just thinking about a practice. They're thinking about how it feeds into everything. That can really help with adoption. All right, um, I'll let's go through this 
really quickly. This, these are the slides I thought about taking out. Um, so theory of planned behavior, this probably looks familiar to some of you. I like it as a way to think through, if you want to try and get one, a practice adopted, theory of planned behavior argues you should think about one practice at a time and what are the characteristics of that practice. And that first somebody has to, well first people have to have behavioral intent before they adopt. So they have to be, have the intent to adopt and then they will adopt maybe but people get stuck here for a long time. Um, things that influence behavioral intent are the attitudes towards behavior, social norms, and perceived behavioral control. And if we use the example of in someone's intention to restore wetlands, so we want someone to actually restore wetlands, that's our project, we can look at social norms, and we can look at two types of social norms. The first is descriptive norms. So what are other people doing? And this is a quote from a focus group that I just really like. I base a lot of what I do on relatives because they're big operators and they like to talk, right? So that's, you start to see how social norms work, right? Like, I talk to my, my big relatives, and this is what they're doing. I see them doing it, so that makes me think it's better. Subjective norms, what do other people think I should do, comes back to networks again, right? Who's in that farmer's network, and what do they think you should do? So if you're a conservation staff member, and you go out and talk to a farmer and say, you should, you should restore your wetland, conservation farmer's going to go to their retailer and say, hey, this person came and talked to me. What do you think? So you want to make sure that retailer's on board and at least knows kind of what the message is. We have attitudes towards the behavior. Do people care about protecting habitat, protecting water quality? Do they perceive a relative advantage or disadvantage over existing practices? They're going to ask if it's going to take too much land out of production. Is it compatible with other practices? Will it help them create a legacy? That could be an attitude that could be really important for a farmer, right, who's looking at long term. They're really interested in the stewardship of that land. And then perceived behavioral control. Am I worried about regulations if I don't do this voluntarily? Do I own the land or am I going to have to work with a renter or a, or a landowner? That can be a really big issue in terms of perceived behavioral control. We've talked to both landlords and tenants of the same land where the tenant will say, I can't do that because my landlord won't let me. And the landlord will say, I can't do that because I let the tenant make the decisions on the land. <laughs> right? <laughs> People aren't talking to each other. But that's a perceived, perceived behavioral control issue, not an actual behavioral control issue, but it's super important to understand. Can I get the equipment I need? Will I have ongoing support to keep this operational? So if we have good attitudes, good social norms, good perceived behavioral control, we'll get the intention. We may or may not actually get to restore wetlands. Um, things like actual behavioral control come into play there. Maybe you thought the landlord was going to be OK with it, but they're not. They're, you know, there's also background factors that feed into each of these. So demographics will influence each of these yellow boxes, attitudes, social norms, and perceived behavioral control, who's in your network, how risk averse you are, what your beliefs are, characteristics of your farm operation, how big is it, how small is it, are you near water, how aware you are of the practice, different policies. And then there's all this noise, right? So this is a very nice, simple like, way of theoretically thinking about this. But there's a lot of noise, because farmers don't ever make one decision at a time. And yet theory of planned behavior tries to ask us to think about one decision at a time. But I still think it's an interesting way when you're trying to think about how to get farmers to adopt, to think it through, right? What are the different questions you should be asking? Because those are the types of things that are going to be influencing that decision. Um, all right, I'm going to skip that. But I'm going to say, because you've all seen Diffusion of Innovations, Rogers theory before. The most important thing I think about Everett Rogers' Diffusion of Innovation theory is his focus on maintenance. So theory of planned behavior and a multitude of other behavior change theories stop at practice adoption. Someone stops smoking, right? We're done, right? Well, they might start smoking again. Most people do, right? So, but Everett Rogers has this extra step. So after adoption, people have to confirm that decision. They have to keep doing it. In our ad landscape, we pay people a lot of money to do things for a short time. And we don't really worry about if they're going to keep doing them. We might worry about it, but we don't actively really do anything about it um, that I can see. I think it's really important that we look at what motivates maintenance of practices over time. It's incredibly hard to do because people like me cannot get access to farm bill data to see who adopted practices. So we can survey them over time and find out what they're doing. We did one project in Indiana where we looked at 319 funded projects in the state. What we found there, we surveyed land, we actually did remote sensing of the practices to see how well maintained they were. These are all structural practices. And then we did phone interviews with the landowner to ask what happened. What we found is that the more farmers were connected to local networks, 
the more likely they were to have maintained practices over time. So again, it comes back to networks, right? Networks are important for adoption. They're also important for maintenance. Wondering there if there's some sort of social norm towards BMP maintenance. A lot of these were folks were members of Pheasants Forever groups. So you could just see them going to like their chapter meetings and, hey, how's your buffer strip? Mine's fine. Well, they're talking about it, right? There's and then sense of ownership is important. So landowners who reported high, or more of a hesitancy to participate in a government program were more likely to have maintained that practice over time. So which is something to think about, right? When we think about cost share monies and how quickly like we're just giving to the first people who come in line to get the money, but we actually see more maintenance from the people who needed more convincing, right? They weren't sure it was what they wanted to do and they really thought that decision through before they adopted it are more likely to have maintained it over time. Um, we just did a, a study of early adopters of cover crops, which will hopefully be coming out soon. Um, we found there that farmers are likely to keep using cover crops if they have more experience, if they believe trial and error is an effective mean of, means of learning, and if they have supportive landlords, they're more likely to discontinue use if they're self-funding, so if they're not getting government money. So there's something here with the role of cost share that um, that we, I think we really need to tease out more. I don't see a lot of that in the literature, um, so, so that's, that's just something. All right, my final words here, um, I just want to throw in that targeting is not a dirty word. Um, it often is perceived to be so in the ag landscape. Farmers don't like it, so therefore DC won't fund targeted programs. It's not true. Jay Arbuckle did a survey um, and, and here in Iowa. We did interviews in Indiana. Emily's done interviews in Iowa. And we're all finding that farmers understand that not all land is created equal. And it is okay to target monies to land that is disproportionately contributing towards water quality. And we need to start doing that. All right, you've heard my takeaway. I'll skip through that. Okay. Um, well, it's all the stuff I said. It's just a summary. So additional considerations. Um, information is really necessary, but it's not sufficient to get somebody to change their mind, right? And farmers or anybody, we can tell people you can know all about the right thing to do, but it's not going to be enough. But even so, we do need to do information. So how do we do it? Do demonstration projects really work? I think we need to start really critically asking these questions, which I'm not seeing us critically asking um, as an ag community at this point. Um, is the internet a way we can do this? A lot of younger farmers are on Twitter and that's where they're getting their information is what they tell me. So should we be doing more on Twitter? I don't know what the answers are, but I think we need to really be thinking about how do we get this information out? Because if people don't have the information, they're never gonna be able to adopt the practice, right? It's, a, it's only the first step, but it's a very important first step. And then money is really necessary for adoption as well because these practices do cost money, but it's clearly not sufficient, right? We've, we have, there's cost share money returned in lots and lots of watersheds across this Midwestern landscape because they can't get takers for the money. So it's not the only thing that's, that's limiting people from adopting. So I left a little bit of time um, for questions or comments or anything. Yes. Um, so you were talking about non-point sources. What do you think is going to happen with the more water works lawsuit and the non-point source counties are suing? No idea. Okay. <laughs> but I will tell you that the entire Midwest is watching. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's very very interesting. Um, it's I mean it's yeah, it's very interesting. I have no idea. So we'll see. We will. Yeah. Yes. So uh, when corn prices shot up, I think there was now there really seems a lot of like CRP land wasn't um, renewed. So mm -hmm. does um, I guess I don't know if any of your data was going on during that time, or if you were able to tease out any of the. Uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. So, uh, but um, like, does money trump all when it comes to farmers, or if, if they see eight dollar Oh, so not all farmers, some farmers did renew their CRP contracts, right? So again, it goes back to all fa farmers are motivated by different things, right? And so some of the farmers who are seeing some of those off-land benefits, their CRP contracts renewed them. Other farmers are more motivated by the money, um, which I think is true of a lot of us too, right? That we all get, even if we don't want to be greedy, we tend to get a little greedy when things like that happen. Um, but it is an issue. And I don't, do we have data? We don't have data that can exactly track what happened there, but I mean, it's clear in yeah, I mean you can see it. Well, you can see it in the in the data. You can also see it in remotely sense, you know, time analysis of the landscape. That a lot more land went to corn. Yes. 
what is the influence of the farmer's neighbor? Have you been able to get at that? So studies on the focus or a foci of an adoption and does it spread? Uh, so it's actually very complicated. Um, so, I mean, the first column, the most influential is family and friends. Is family and friends and neighbor? Not necessarily. Farmers are super competitive, increasingly so, against their neighbors because they want the land if something happens, right? Because everybody's trying to get bigger. They want the neighbor's land. We have farmers tell us they don't talk to their neighbors, but they know what their neighbors are doing because they talk to the CCA who's working with that. They have the same CCA, so they're getting information. Like they don't think the other farmer's getting information about them is a little confusing to me. But I, <laughs> I think they're probably talking about all of you. Um, so they're definitely watching each other. They know what the visible practices they know about. How much they talk, I think it's going to really vary watershed to watershed. So Indian Creek, the case study I showed, they do talk to each other. It's a small homogenous community, right? So they, they talk to each other, but that is definitely not the case in other watersheds. And it's much harder to get that dissemination when there's that distrust and people aren't talking to each other and they're suspicious and they're waiting for them to die and they're, you know, whatever else, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or if it's rented land, right? They're hoping something goes wrong so they can jump right in and be the next person to rent the land. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very different than it was 20, 30 years ago. <laughs>